I'm thrilled to introduce our next speaker, Nathan Silberman. Nathan is a seasoned technology leader with deep expertise in machine learning. Most recently, Nathan was the VP of machine learning at Path AI, where his organization was responsible for developing state-of-the-art machine learning models that interpret gigapixel-scale pathology images to identify tissue types, discover naval biomakers, and produce clinical and diagnostic results. Prior to Path AI, Nathan was the VP of Artificial Intelligence at Butterfly Network, where he led the development of a suite of real-time ultrasound products that assist clinicians in acquiring and interpreting diagnostic images. Nathan also previously worked at Google Research, where he co-developed an internal library that became the Google's TensorFlow 1.0 API. He obtained his PhD and BA from New York University. Nathan, over to you. My name is Natan Silberman, and I'm gonna be talking about the challenges of developing models for gigapixel scale pathology image interpretation. If you're not familiar, histopathology is the study of human tissue to better understand disease. Pathology samples are collected and analyzed in a four-step process. A tissue sample is extracted from someone's body. It's set onto a piece of glass and chemically treated to preserve it. It's stained with a different chemical formula that's tailored to highlight aspects of the tissue or cellular anatomy. And then finally, a human, traditionally, analyzes the tissue. You may already be aware of how pathologists analyze biopsy samples from patients suspected of having a particular disease. However, pathology isn't just for diagnostics. Drug development is the process of taking a known drug molecule into clinical practice. It's extremely hard to do and very often promising drug candidates fail to be effective on certain patients during clinical trials. Biopharma companies are increasingly interested in analyzing pathology images to improve drug development in various ways. For example, even if a drug doesn't work for everyone, can we identify a subset of patients that it reliably does work for? Biopharma companies are working on identifying patterns called biomarkers in pathology slides that are predictive of patients' responses to a particular drug. Drug discovery is the process of identifying novel molecules and medications for diseases. During this phase, pathology slides from clinical trials and clinical practice are of immense use in understanding the highly complicated nature of human biology and cellular anatomy. Across all these areas, there's far more demand to interpret pathology images than there are pathologists. And the size of the data sets involved often makes human interpretation impossible. So in short, there is potential for machine learning to do this at scale, and it's enormous. Unfortunately, one of the biggest hurdles to operationalizing machine learning solutions in pathology is the sheer scale of each individual pathology image. Each image can easily be 100,000 by 100,000 pixels. So compare that to, uh, say, a traditional 224 by 224 ResNet input. This illustration is actually not even to scale. A better comparison or visualization might be comparing uh, NBA star James Harden at six foot five to two Empire State buildings stacked on top of another. That is the scale that we're talking about in just either height or width. In practice, this means that you can't even load pathology images onto your GPU without running out of memory. Many GPUs, many uh, pathology slides are 30 gigabytes alone, which exceeds the memory capacity of the vast majority of GPUs. And even if you could manage to get a pathology image onto a GPU somehow, uh, state-of-the-art neural networks require the creation of multiple layers of feature maps, which themselves also won't fit into GPU memory. It's worth pointing out that gigapixel scale isn't just a pathology problem. Many industries like agriculture, astronomy, and climate monitoring are being inundated with images of enormous and growing scale. And the computational tooling, which has proven so well for so many computer vision applications, unfortunately just can't be used out of the box for images of this magnitude. Conceptually, there are three ways to deal with gigapixel images. Downtemple the images, split the images into smaller tiles and do some compute on each one of those tiles. And then finally, apply sophisticated techniques to both learning and inference routines to allow them to operate at the gigapixel scale. 
In computer vision, downsampling is super common, nearly standard across a wide range of applications, and that usually results in an image resolution that retains enough detail to be useful while permitting efficient interpretation. Unfortunately, in the pathology space, the fine-grained details really matter. Discriminating between immune cells is already difficult and becomes impossible very quickly when you shrink the image size. So downsampling, unfortunately, isn't a realistic solution. The second approach is called tiling. To explain, uh, let's use the example task of classification. We're given a single slide from a patient, and we're trying to determine whether or not they have a cancerous tumor. Rather than try to train a model on entire slides at a time, let's break up the image into tiles. For each tile, we can ask a pathologist to label uh, each tile as either containing a tumor or being cancer-free. The landmark paper Deep Learning for Identifying Metastatic Breast Cancer uses exactly this approach. They first gathered a data set of image tiles, some of which a pathologist labeled as normal and others which they labeled as tumorous. And they then, trend, they then trained a tile classifier, a model that predicted which tiles were normal and which were tumorous. Keep in mind that this model is making predictions at the tile level uh, and not at the patient level. To make predictions for an individual patient, we then take the patient slide and extract overlapping tiles from every few pixels. Our tile classifier, previously trained, examines each tile and produces a probability that that tile contains a tumor or not, and those predictions can be visualized or represented as a probability of tumor map, where each location or pixel represents where a tile was extracted from the original image, and its value is the model's confidence of finding a tumor there or not. Next, given a data set of probability of tumor maps, the team then extracted a number of handcrafted features that represent the entire slide. And uh, on all of these features from multiple slides, they trained a random forest to perform the final patient level classification of tumor or not. So this approach works very well. Still not quite at human level performance, but the combination of human experts along with model predictions does exceed human experts alone. So to summarize, this work clearly demonstrated that machine learning models could be trained accurately on gigapixel scale images by avoiding training on the entire image, and instead in doing this in two stages. Firstly, training on smaller tiles extracted from the, in, from the image, and then combining those uh, predictions of each tile in such a manner that could produce a whole slide or patient level prediction. Um, some downsides. Um, we're a little bit limited in this approach by uh, our, our uh, creativity about which handcrafted features we might devise. Um, additionally, as mentioned, we are required to label each tile that we want to use for training. So this is a, uh, an expensive and time-consuming process. Uh, and then finally, depending on the tile size that we decide to choose, we may be limited in terms of the spatial context. So if we are using tiles of 250 by 250 pixels, for example, and it happens that the machine learning model needs to see uh, something of a larger spatial context, then we're going to be limited in terms of model performance. To overcome some of these limitations, a multiple instance learning has been used effectively on gigapixel sized images. The high level intuition behind multiple instance learning is as follows. Rather than performing tile classification in one stage and then patient classification in a second stage, we can combine these in a way that lets us train a model directly to predict patient level scores from the tiles themselves in one stage. So to do this, we'll start by sampling some tiles from the scene. Um, and then each one of those tiles are fed to our machine learning model to predict uh, an embedding or uh, the output prediction that we care about, uh, such as whether the tile is normal or tumorous. Finally, those intermediate predictions are aggregated through a differentiable function like the mean function or the, ma uh, the max function to produce a single slide level prediction. To see this works in practice, imagine that our model predicts that each tile has a low probability of a tumor, uh, e.g. it's normal. So in, that in this case, the max aggregate function would determine that the entire slide or patient is normal. Conversely, imagine that our model believes a single tile has a high probability of being a tumor. In this case, the max aggregate function would determine that the slide or patient is abnormal or contains a tumor. So that works as, uh, as we would hope. 
But it does leave us with a very big open question, which is how do we go about choosing which tiles to sample during both training and inference? We clearly cannot use every single tile in an image. So at gigapixel scale, there are about 10 billion total tiles to choose from. Um, and even if we wanted to, uh, during training, uh, use only something like non-overlapping tiles, that still leaves us with about 200,000 tiles to perform inference on before we can get the final slide level score, uh, really prohibitively expensive. So we have to do something a little bit more intelligent. Of course, on the flip side, if we use too few images uh, per tile, we may not have enough signal in uh, that tile sample to allow the algorithm to learn. Let me illustrate the problem of too few tiles with the following example. Imagine we had a data set of gigapixel sized images of sandy beaches and pure ocean scenes. And we decide we're gonna use multiple instances learning to classify each image in one shot. So let's say we only use four tiles uh, with randomly chosen locations as, fo as, uh, as follows. So this particular sample might be enough for the model to decide that this is a beach scene, right? We have a, a sky, uh, an ocean tile, two beach tiles. Uh, that combination sounds pretty beachy to me. Um, but what if instead we randomly selected a different set of tiles? So here we've accidentally selected two sky tiles and two ocean tiles. In this case, it would be totally sensible, sensible for the model to conclude that it's looking at an ocean scene. Back in the pathology world, this means that we need to really be thoughtful about how we choose samples. During training time, there are various strategies used to carefully curate samples of tiles that allows the model to learn the right signal. And during test time, practitioners often use multiple samples of an image, perform, each, uh, perform inference on each one of these sets of samples called a bag, and then it takes an average over multiple samplings. One unfortunate aspect of the aggregate function in multiple instance learning is that it permits the model to take certain shortcuts. So imagine this image where the slide label, the truth, uh, is that the model is tumorous. And once trained, the model predicts that one tile that it has sampled is tumorous and it will happen to get the entire slide correct. But what if every tile should have been predicted as tumorous? So the model was able to take a shortcut and it happened to get the right answer, but it's likely that if one, that one positive tile didn't exist or it wasn't sampled, that uh, the model would have gotten the wrong answer. These types of model shortcuts can be overcome, but it often means uh, acquiring a sufficient amount of data and using the right tiling or sampling strategy. And this is still very much an open area of research. So empirically, multiple instance learning works very well for classification and regression tasks and it has the really fantastic benefit of only needing patient level labels. Um, unlike our previous two-stage process where a pathologist had to painstakingly label each tile that we wanted to use in the training process, multiple instance learning allows us to have a much sparser set of labels and to still train on it. On the con side, we do need to be very thoughtful about how we tile. And unlike the multi-stage process, uh, the multiple instance learning uh, approach isn't as easy to interpret so when it fails, we need to do a lot more debugging to understand why it's actually failing. Um, additionally, the model can take shortcuts as we just showed, and uh, as a consequence, is it's much easier for the model to overfit. Now, one approach that uh, alleviates some of this is attention-based multiple instance learning. So in this approach, we'll start by sampling some tiles from the scene. Tiles are fed to our machine learning model, which this time produces both a prediction about whether the tile is normal or tumorous, as well as a weight, essentially a number that represents or communicates how much the final prediction should emphasize or attend to this tile. Finally, the predictions are aggregated through a differentiable function again, weighted by the predicted weights to produce a score for the entire slide. One really nice aspect of attention-based multiple instance learning is that we can visualize where the model is attending to, which makes interpreting what the model is doing much easier for both clinicians who need to be able to trust these models, as well as uh, machine learning practitioners themselves. So overall, uh, attention-based MIL approaches do improve performance. Uh, and as I mentioned, it really helps interpretability. Um, unfortunately, the model, generally speaking, still can take some shortcuts. Um, and the weights typically uh, learned in attention-based approaches uh, are a little bit limited. 
The weights learned indicate areas where the model is attending to, but since the model is aggregating over all tiles to produce a single prediction, it's possible to have low weights for a cancerous tile if another cancerous tile has already been highly weighted. An approach just recently published which attempts to improve on this is additive multiple instance learning. In this approach, the algorithm samples tiles from this slide as before and produces both predictions and weights per tile, but it has a couple of important differences. First, rather than aggregate tile predictions through a nonlinearity, additive MIL simply takes a sum over nonlinear weighted patch predictions. Secondly, the model is able to produce per class weightings. So these two together mean that a positive weight value can be clearly interpreted as excitatory for a class, and negative weight values can be clearly interpreted as being inhibitory for a class. Because additive MIL explicitly models excitatory and inhibitory weights, it's less likely to produce false positive mistakes. So consider this pathology image. Here's a result from an attention-based MIL model, and here is a result from an additive-based MIL model. The intensity of each one of these uh, red blocks or tiles re represents the magnitude of the weights. In the attention-based model, it attends to a part of the image that happens to be non-cancerous. It ultimately does get the slide level prediction correct, but in terms of interpretation, it's very misleading. In contrast, the additive MIL model doesn't make this mistake as its per-class weights are trained to inhibit attention to this area, and our interpretation of the prediction is totally consistent with slide-level prediction. Furthermore, because additive MIL has a different weight per class, we can very easily interpret what the model is fixated on for each one of the classes in our problem. What you're seeing here are uh, parts of much larger slides which illustrate the degree to which additive MIL can clearly attend to different parts of the image for different classes that it's concerned with. So overall, additive MIL works very well empirically and improves on the interpretability uh, of alternative approaches. Ultimately, additive MIL is just one extension of many really great tile-based solutions that are meant to deal with the scale involved in pathology images. However, uh, like many of these tile-based approaches, it doesn't totally overcome the overfitting problem uh, nor the problem of dealing with limited spatial context. Let's return to the basic problem. We know that when we're trying to load an entire image into GPU memory, we're going to run into problems, and that just training or inference uh, on the GPU gets totally swamped with images of the scale. But is there a way to train or run inference in a manner that doesn't totally swamp the GPU memory? Maybe being clever about memory allocation. So say you have an image, and represented here are uh, the feature maps that you'd get by uh, produced uh, by a series of convolutions, followed by pooling steps, followed by more convolutions, and more pooling steps, as is typically done in neural networks. So we know that the image can't fit into GPU memory, and we know that the first couple feature maps also won't fit into GPU memory. But once the spatial resolution of the feature maps gets small enough after a series of pooling layers, the intermediate feature maps do fit into GPU memory, even for gigapixel images. So that's the intuition behind the following approach. What this approach does is go directly to the intermediate layers and attempts to compute them. Of course, computing the values of the intermediate feature maps, uh, we obviously need to compute the feature maps in the first few layers. And this paper computes those, but in effect, lazily and doesn't ever attempt to instantiate the first few feature maps in GPU memory. Instead, it tiles the computation and memory allocation of the image and the first few resulting feature maps. So for a feature map value in the intermediate layer that does persist in memory, computing it will involve tiling the first few layers of the network in the following manner. Ultimately, this approach trades off or gains the ability to run training and inference on the entire image at a time against the costs of rerunning various aspects of feedforward inf inference and grading computation. And indeed, it does so in a manner that recomputes feedforward and backpropagation on those first couple feature maps multiple times uh, during a single step. 
This isn't the first approach to introducing smart memory management to deal with larger image sizes, but it's a major advance in dealing with gigapixel scale image inputs. Um, and it's really a big step forward towards out of the box training on full size gigapixel images. So this work demonstrates that training on full size gigapixel images rather than tiling the image makes a significant difference in terms of model accuracy and allows models to perform image segmentation without having to worry about edge artifacts typically exhibited by tiling based approaches. So what are the pros and cons? Well, this particular work uh, does perform very, very well across tasks. So it works well for classification, regression, and segmentation. Um, it can deal with either patient level or pixel level labels because uh, it's really not concerned with tiling the image. Uh, when trained on segmentation tasks, uh, one is not gonna run into issues where you tile uh, the image and perform segmentations on different tiles separately and then have to restitch them together. And because uh, one isn't tiling, there isn't a spatial context issue. The model can effectively look at the entire gigapixel image all at the same time. Um, unfortunately, uh, some of the cons are it does have some speed and compute issues. Training is a lot slower as a consequence. Um, as we said before, we're trading off the ability to get the entire scene in terms of the context for speed. Um, but compared to multiple instance learning, there is a potential that this model can overfit even more than multiple instance learning. Ultimately, however, uh, this particular work is a, again, a major step forward towards solving what we are trying to do, which is make uh, gigapixel scale inference and training uh, work out of the box. So to summarize, the potential impact of machine learning applied to pathology images is extremely high. Uh, pathology is currently being used as are AI-based approaches in diagnostics, in drug development, and in drug discovery. Unfortunately, the scale of these images makes all of the approaches that one use very non-trivial, but there have been some very big advances over the last couple of years. Um, most of those advances are in tile-based approaching, uh, tile-based approaches. These approaches work extremely well. They are, uh, are diagnostically accurate. Training and inference can be made extremely efficient, ext uh, especially when parallelized over multiple GPUs on a single machine or across multiple machines in a larger cluster. Uh, these models can be made to have a high degree of interpretability. Uh, but one downside is that they are still limited by some tiling artifacts and, and are uh, a little bit prone to overfitting given the sizes of the data sets commonly used in modeling in the pathology space. Memory-based approaches, that is to say ones that uh, are a bit smart in memory management, but still deal with the entire image all at a time, conceptually offer the best of all worlds. And there has been some fantastic progress in actually performing inference on images of absolutely enormous scale. That being said, speed is still a bottleneck. Um, however, this is very much uh, an active and exciting area of research across both these memory management approaches as well as tiling-based approaches, and I anticipate that we'll continue to see a lot of advances over the next couple of years. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the conference.